Hello everyone, hope you're doing well today. So I suspect that there's gonna be maybe some more people watching from home today, because here in New England this weekend, we are expecting record low temperatures. So I hope all of you in New England are staying warm out there, especially in the Northeast too. So we've been talking about, in light of this really cold winter, we've been talking about winter warmers for a few weeks now, but our registration is again now live for our online campus. Winter warmers is something that we're doing in all of our campuses, where we're sharing a meal with one another in each of our homes. But for the online campus, we're gonna be sharing a wonderful warm meal over Zoom. And our winter warmer is gonna be on March 5th at one o'clock p.m. And you can sign up for that by going to grace.org slash online. The deadline for registration will be next week, February 12th. So please make sure to sign up today or as soon as possible. Also, if you happen to be new or newish to our online campus, or if you've been watching for a while now, but haven't really connected yet with me or what we're doing here in the campus, I'd love to hear from you. So you can send me an email at jkim at grace.org, introducing yourself and I'd love to connect with you. Here at Grace Chapel, we love volunteering and serving and helping each other. And so here's a video about one of the different opportunities you might be able to have to volunteer. Wrong button. <laughs> I want the clapboard. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathleen Haro. I'm the IT Director for Grace Chapel. On my immediate team, I have one individual named Augustine. This feels so awkward. <laughs> I think my favorite part about working with Grace is working with people. Some of the skills that we would be looking for in a volunteer would be just an interest to learn, working independently. I think for any other person that would like to volunteer with IT, proximity to a campus, you know, there are only two of us. We have five campuses that we're supporting. So you don't have to be like a, a rocket science to be working in IT, but any assistance that kind of helps us uh, perform our duties better would, would be really helpful. I'm Archie Selman and I'm the Director of Facilities. I've been working here since the fall of 2022. Hi, my name is Rich. I'm on the facilities maintenance team. Hi, my name is Jean-Claude. I go by JC. I'm with the maintenance department. I've been working for 19 years, and we are the facilities team. We're looking for help for anybody who's interested in working with their hands, moving material, to uh, building things like office chairs. So in addition to our short-term opportunities for volunteers, we have some long-term opportunities that would be some research and planning, utility cost reduction, maybe adding some solar or wind production on our properties, even some architectural help helping us with some egress areas. We are looking for a lead facilities volunteer for each campus. So if you like coordinating things, communicating with people, and checking things off a to-do list, Look me up and we'll get you hooked up with your campus. So if you have a skill with your hands and you want to serve the Lord, let us know. Come join our team. If you'd like to volunteer for one of these amazing groups, you can go to grace.org slash volunteer. In a little bit, Pastor Tim Galley, the pastor of discipleship at Grace Chapel, will be continuing our series called One Another, The Risk of a With Others Lives. And at the end of our service today, we're gonna to be having a time of communion. So please make sure to grab something to drink or to eat as we prepare for that later in our service. Before we do that, let's take a moment to pray together. God, we thank you so much for the opportunities to worship you here today to be able to hear your words and to hear the truth that you want us to hear and the ways that you are speaking into our lives. Would our hearts be open and ready to receive it today? And would we worship you with all of our hearts in whatever place that we may find ourselves in worship today? We love you and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Too many of our relationships feel fractured from judgment and unresolved tension these days. Some feel broken and in need of repair. Some have felt that cancel culture has moved from celebrities to family members. There's quiet quitting, there's ghosting, there's leaving on red, and all sorts of modern ways to ignore one another and leave issues not only without closure, but with little future opportunity for reconciliation. How do we move from hostility and tension towards peace and forgiveness? Can healing and restoration actually be found, or are these just niceties? Can we reclaim the confidence that we once had in strong and loving relationships and friendships? In a time where we are canceling each other, we're going to look to Scripture for wisdom that, that can actually help. We're halfway in our winter series called One Another, the risk of a with others life. And we have covered the movement from lonely to loved. We talked about the importance of empathy and listening and showing hospitality. And today we want to focus on the movement from hostility and tension towards peace and forgiveness. And we want to look at Colossians chapter 3, one of my favorite texts. Verse 12 begins with, Therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Oh, such a rich, beautiful piece of Scripture. This is actually one of the climatic parts of, Col of the book of Colossians, right here in chapter 3. And one of the reasons is because like any church, the ancient church here also had dramatic conflicts. And Paul's writing to these churches and the Christians in this Colossian audience. And so for a moment, 
I want to revisit this, but I want to skip verse 12 for a moment and look again at verse 13. He's saying, in the midst of your strife, bear with each other and forgive one another if any one of you has a grievance against someone. Bear with each other. That's like the the concept there is to hold steadfast to these relationships. Cling to these relationships. Hold on. Bear with each other. The message paraphrases it like this. It says, be even-tempered, content with second place. Yeah, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. And then the second part of that verse moves quickly to forgive one another and then follows with forgive as the Lord forgives you. Now we have to stop and take note of the theological aspects of forgiveness here. And we'll do that in a moment. And over all these virtues, it says, to put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Oh, man, this is a lot to live up to. And it makes sense, you know, in church, you know, we just sang some songs talking about the amazing love of God. We've received them from wherever you are. We're, we're, we're gathering in some sense. We're worshiping and we want to live lives of love and forgiveness and peace and reconciliation. It makes a lot of sense in church. But too often, in the, out in the wilderness of life, this isn't actually what we experience. Relationships across the many forms of family and friendship and those found at work and in church and beyond. Now, I love forgiveness stories. You know, I find them moving and powerful and inspirational. Stories like the one Jesus tells of the prodigal son story, like, you are never beyond redemption regardless of what you've done. And maybe you've had that that amazing experience where a relationship was actually strengthened after a conflict that was finally settled and resolved and forgiveness was experienced. Sometimes we say, "I, I wish that didn't happen, but I'm glad that we're closer as a result of it. We all want another chance. We don't want to give up on each other or be given up on. So how do we get into so many of these broken relationships? There's countless stories throughout life. And what about the stories littered across our lives that the conflict has had no resolve? In fact, there was even some energy and hopes of some type of reconciliation, but none actually came. I want to tell you a few and what I learned from them. Years ago, I got caught in some type of a conflict, and somehow I had managed to deeply offend someone that it was actually paying a compliment to. I know, I know, I don't know how. Among the feelings of it though was was a sense of humiliation. I mean, how did I mess this up? This was supposed to be a good thing. It felt so unnecessary. It was was someone that I held a, a sense of admiration for, and I'll spare you the details, but it was it felt like a misunderstanding, but I, I wanted to own the blame, so I, I reached out to apologize. And the phone was never answered. And that's okay. So I, I left a as heartfelt of a voicemail as I could saying, hey, I'm calling to ask you for forgiveness. And when you're ready, I'd, I'd be grateful if we could talk or, or even meet in person sometime. There would be periods of just radio silence. And I took that as a sign as the other person wasn't ready to speak to me. Eventually, we exchanged emails that said, we're good, let's meet in person. And the day before that appointment, the other person canceled. So we rescheduled. But just before that second one, the other person canceled. And then again, with a third time, oh, the tension of it all felt like it had just snowballed beyond the original offense. And I tried my best to leave it as, if you ever want to talk about this, I'm here. And that was it. Now, I'm sure the other side moved on long before I did on this one. I mean, I wanted that moment to explain. I I was actually trying to compliment you. It's the funniest thing. And I'm so sorry just how all of this went. I'm, I'm sorry that I offended you. I'm sorry that you experienced hurt from me. And as awkward as it is to admit on camera here, I, I didn't want this person to see me as a villain in their life story. I also wanted to know that when I saw this person again, that it was all good again. Maybe even something that we might even laugh about one day. I wanted to know that I was forgiven. 
but I felt canceled. After a while, the lack of closure and the lack of the reciprocation of my efforts created a little bit of a cynicism in me that was working opposite of the contrition and humility that I once had. You move from, I'm so deeply sorry, I really am. And then you get to, why has this person refused to forgive me? Who does this person think that they are? What, what do they think of me and, and what more do they want? Ignoring my calls, canceling our meetup three times? It got rough. Maybe you've experienced something like that as well. In light of Colossians 3, they, they didn't want to bear with you. They didn't want to bear with me. They didn't want to forgive you. They didn't want to forgive me. Lessons learned included the following. One was pursue forgiveness. Always pursue forgiveness. In the long run, you won't, for, you won't regret it. It would have been more regrettable had I tried to justify any of it and allow my cynicism to actually take over. Two, when there is no closure, pursue peace instead and leave the door open. That one's tough because the lack of closure feels like a form of rejection. But peace, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, peace is going to help us move forward again. Three, remember how the, this experience felt to you so that you may be moved to forgive others. Do I really want others to be put through something like this by me? May we pray for the strength to forgive others the way that the Lord has forgiven us. I believe that God can redeem these moments if we allow him to. I want to go back to Colossians 3 here. Often we find ourselves in moments where we are trying to discern what we should do. And we, we face a sort of an identity search, maybe even an identity crisis. Let me explain. When we say things to ourselves like, like, who are they to think they are better than me? Who do they think they are? I'll show them what I'm about. They're going to regret disrespecting me. These are statements that reveal a bit of how we compare status and express aspects of our personality. They reveal a bit about our self-esteem and maybe even some of our insecurities. Here's one of many instances of being a follower of Jesus makes all the difference. How, how make, being a follower of Jesus makes all the difference. If you believe that you are spiritually reborn in Jesus, that you are a new creation, receive these words from Colossians 3, but let's now start with verse 12 this time. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Living in that identity that Jesus gives is the game changer here. And then we return to this, the theological meaning of it. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Back in verses, verse 1 through 3 in in, uh, in Colossians 3, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. That's a lot of richness there. We are now identified in the death and life of Christ. And our old self is gone, and our new self lives. And that's going to make a difference and how we forgive, and how we interact in conflict in times that need reconciliation. This is where Jesus changes things, if we let him. Instead of seeing life as exclusively through the lens of everything that happens to me, the Apostle Paul invites us to see that because of forgiveness, Jesus gives us this restoration, this vision for relationship. A restoration of a relationship that we've enjoyed with God and that we can extend to others. So set your minds on things above, he says. This helps put things into perspective. But it starts with a new understanding of our new identity. When we understand the identity that Jesus gives us and what his forgiveness gives us, we can find the grace to forgive others. Or said in another way, taking the risk to bear with one another 
to forgive one another and to allow the peace of Christ to reign in our hearts can help us grow in the one another life. I want to tell you a second story. And as consistent as the word risk is being used in our subtitle, there's risk in, in, in how I tell these stories here too. And I'll, and I'll do my best to be just and fair and loving. It's back when I left my first church and the lessons that I learned from that. I was, I was just out of seminary. Um, I still had that new pastor smell on me, uh, which is different from like the seminary smell. The seminary smell is like dusty old books and coffee breath and cafeteria. But the new pastor smell, you know, it's like sanctified cinnamon or something. It's great. I had all these dreams and, and ideas and, and, and I was thrilled to be able to enter into the ministry. I knew it would be tough, but I was deeply committed to the calling. It's all a long story, but after five years filled with many highs and challenges, I decided it was time to move on from, from that church. And I didn't want to get into the details because I knew that that would not be helpful. It is rarely helpful from the person leaving. I use language like, I've learned so much, I'm, I'm truly grateful, and it's time for me to look for a new chapter in my life. It's, it's time for a change in ministry. And I never change script. And I know, I know when, when, when people hear something like that, they come up to you in the lobby or in the parking lot or private phone calls, and they're like, why are you really leaving? And yeah, obviously, there was, there was challenges that, that, that I, I didn't want to communicate. Like nobody ever leaves their job saying, it's just too wonderful and I need, I need something more miserable. I'm hoping to turn into a workaholic. I, I'm hoping maybe I can find some type of depression in my next role. Like nobody says that. So I just kept saying, it's just time for me to move on. Look, it is never easy on anyone when a pastor leaves. There's a temporary hole that needs immediate filling. Often volunteers need to step up quickly. Search committees have to form and there's meetings, meetings and conversations and decisions. And I appreciated all that. I'd also believe that if I, if I had left with, in peace, then peace would return to me at some point. At the time, I believed that if I left with the hopes of having you know, some dignity and some class or measure of respect, and if I left with as little drama as possible, that it would also allow for many of these relationships to continue. So I did truly love the people that, that were part of my life then. I've seen this happen, and I've also seen this not happen. Well, unfortunately, about a month later, I, I received a, a phone call from the head of the search committee of a church that I was interviewing at. I remember exactly where I was driving, and. And as the conversation intensified, I remember the parking lot that I pulled over at. And he called to tell me that he had received a really bad reference about me. I was surprised by a number of things. One was, I, I was not informed that I was even at this stage of the process. And I said, I would have liked to have given you some additional context and, and also provide my actual references. And then when I heard what was said, I was stunned a bit. I mean, given the personalities involved, I... I knew they were not constructing a statue in my honor. But what I was told was pretty awful and hurtful for me. For a short while, I actually second-guessed my decision of, of choosing not to say more on my way out. And for another while, I, I wanted revenge. And a few weeks later, when I came to my senses, I made a few phone calls to the appropriate leaders to confront what was said and clarify what we should expect from one another in the future. And now we're, how we'll refer to one another. That was not a pleasant conversation, as you can imagine. There was no remorse, and I left with feelings of anger and resentment. In the coming months, as these things go, there would be funerals that I chose to attend at my previous church. And they happened to include family members of those who were part of this regrettable situation. I didn't attend those funerals out of any ulterior motive, in this case, you were elderly women who were so kind to Susan and myself. I did carry a hidden hope that down the road that there would be points of reconciliation and forgiveness. But m most of these exchanges were, were getting frostier and frostier. Now, in the earlier story, I mentioned that I, I felt left hanging from trying to receive forgiveness from a person that I had offended. In this one, I felt left hanging 
that no one was attempting to reconcile with me. Through the help of trusted confidence and a, and a, counts, and a form of counseling that specializes in these types of matters, and by the goodness of God, I was eventually able to move on. And I was able to forgive even if no one was asking me for it. And here's what I learned. Again, one, pursue forgiveness. In the long run, you won't regret it. Second, when there is no closure, pursue peace instead and leave the door open. And three, remember how this experience felt to you so that you may be moved to seek forgiveness for the wrongs that you commit. In the time that we have here, I, I, I want to focus especially on the second point. And I want to read Colossians 3, chapter 15, about peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Peace? Yeah, peace. Often in the brokenness and the hostility of these relationships, we feel a stalemate. You know, it takes two to fix this mess. Yeah, it does. But it may not be the two that you're thinking about. It may not be you and the person that you're in conflict with. Often the second person may be Jesus, the greatest model of forgiveness, forgiveness that we have. Jesus can help us here. What does the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts mean? Well, it doesn't mean that somehow these acts that feel humiliating and insulting and painful no longer matter. And it doesn't mean peace is just, we're just going to swallow these serrated experiences and, and God will just magically help you get over it. No. The peace of Christ is about ruling in our hearts. It's about life in the kingdom of Jesus. The way of Jesus. This, this with God life. This with others life. So peace isn't simply about being nice or non-confrontational. Peace, in the Christian sense, is a power maybe even a superpower. Remember, they call Jesus, who being who he is, the most powerful person to ever set foot on this earth, they call Jesus the Prince of Peace. Peace is a power that can conquer hate, that can drive out fear, that can heal our anger, that, that can overcome our lust for revenge. And not only that, the peace of Christ, the power of Christ, can heal, can bring truth, can help you experience the love of God and remind you of the forgiveness that you have in God and help you move forward. Oh, let that peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And then Paul says, and be thankful. Yes, yes, because of this, I can be thankful. And what started out as, as absurd, well, because of the work of Jesus, is suddenly very realistic and something that I hope to experience. And something that I'm glad that I did get to experience in, in these accounts. One more thing. That church. It turned out a few weeks later that the church that was looking for the reference offered me the job. And I was humbled by that. It turned out that there was these... I mean, I, I, I jokingly referred to him as a guardian angel, but there was... A, a mutual point of reference that was able to vouch for me in the midst of all of this. I, I, I had no way of knowing about this until they explained it all to me. I, had no, I didn't even know this person really existed type of a thing. And I felt that God was watching over me. I felt that I could put my trust in this process of seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. And the Lord would, would provide. I was humbled by that. I ended up not taking that job. I, we ended up moving uh, to glorious New Jersey. But I learned so many important lessons in that time of my life. And I find gratitude in that. I'm also humbled by these extraordinary stories of forgiveness that we hear about in our news cycles. And I think years ago, I remember the story that, that came out of the there was sets of stories, actually, that came out of the Charleston church shooting in 2017 when the mother of one of the nine victims, Felicia Sanders, told the killer at, 
at an emotional sentencing hearing, she said, I forgive you. Tragically, the same shooting, an 18-year-old son named Chris Singleton, who lost his mother to the killer, he says to him, I forgive you. I think of what is on our new cycle right now. I pray and I wonder and I think about the killing of Tyree Nichols, and I grieve for him and his family, and so many angles of this horrific story. I think of what happened in, in Duxbury just, just a couple of weeks ago, where a mother allegedly killed three of her own children before attempting to take her own life in the midst of a reported struggle with postpartum psychosis and depression. As a father, as a husband, as anyone with a soul, it is, it's such a difficult story to wrap your mind around. I mean, how can this happen? Who would do such a thing? I, I admit, I had to, at numerous points, just look away. I mentioned this as, as I knew I was preaching on this topic for, for a good while, and I'd speculated about what parts of the news, if any, I would actually use. And then the news contacted me, literally. The other day, we were contacted by Sarah Kanji from WCVB Boston, the, the Five at Five, because the father and husband in this Duxbury tragedy, Patrick Clancy, released a powerful statement that said that he has forgiven his wife, Lindsay. And he is asking that we, as a society, also forgive Lindsay. And he goes on to explain a bit more about their life and family. And, and he described his wife as the real Lindsay was generously loving and caring towards everyone, me, our kids, family, friends, and her, and her patients. The very fibers of her soul are loving. And all I wish for her now is that she can somehow find peace. The news reporter, Sarah, wanted a statement from a local pastor on the topic of forgiveness. And since I had been preparing a message on one, I was, I was interviewed for a few minutes. Local daily news moves extremely fast. I felt like I was asked, uh, I, I agreed, I was contacted immediately, and before I knew it, I was on a Zoom call being asked a few questions. They ended up using one line of, of what I said in the few minutes, and truthfully, if it's of any help, then that's wonderful, and, and praise be to God. What wasn't shown, the first question that I was asked was, was why do you think Patrick asked us to forgive Lindsay? Well, I, I can't be completely sure. But I couldn't help but feel that forgiveness begins a process where even the unimaginable can somehow and miraculously be forgiven. Not in a, it's all going to be fine sense. That's not the type of stuff I'm talking about. But forgiveness allows us to see a person that we may have dismissed as a monster. Forgiveness re restores human dignity. It, it allows this person to be seen as a human again, a, a very hurting human named Lindsay. It was tempting for me to dismiss the story as what monster could do such a thing and click away. No, no, no. Forgiveness allows us to care again. Not cancel, not dismiss, but to care again. I want to be very clear here. Forgiveness does not mean that we forget what has happened or that it suddenly cancels the wrongness or the evil of it. I mean, forgiveness does not automatically erase the pain. And nor does it mean that the relationship can be restored to what it was. I, I, I think of such points in situations of abuse and many unsafe relationships. Forgiveness may not ever be able to restore that relationship, and often it shouldn't. I was also asked, what does forgiveness do? Oh, praise God. It has the potential to do much. And one thing that it does do is forgiveness has the power to release us from the anger and resentment that we've experienced. And it allows, it frees us to move forward with our life again. It has the power to release us from the anger and resentment that we have and frees us to move forward with our life again. That's actually the, what I was quoted in saying on, on the show that day. It's my observation that it's often when we say, no, I could never forgive that, that perhaps we may unknowingly 
have taken our very first step actually towards forgiveness. That initial reaction of, I just can't. I just may not be able or actually refuse. The, the I just can't may, may not actually be a refusal, but a healthy understanding of the cost and nature of forgiveness. And may we also experience the power of forgiveness found in and through Jesus. But often when we say we can't, that's sometimes the very first step that we need to take. Forgiveness holds power for you and and for the other, and in this case, Patrick. Countless others have, have been invited to experience the power of forgiveness. It's both inspirational and humbling. Friends, I know this is a very heavy message. And I wish I could lighten it up with, with more humor. I wish I could make this easy for you. But conflict can be heartbreaking. And we can't automate something like forgiveness. It's going to take the work of the soul. But I also cannot help but feel this is what the world needs. That this is what we need. The examples that we mentioned and these stories that you have experienced, they, they require much healing And as I survey our cultural landscape and and the many complicated and hurting family relationships, and when I consider the countless number of us who feel that all these unresolved feelings and and, and relational stalemates, I, I go back to these words in Colossians 3, and I just feel that they are so needed. And so, dear friends, may we be willing to receive this truth today. May we be willing to take the risk to bear with one another, to forgive one another, and to allow the peace of Christ to reign in our hearts so that we can grow in the one another life. I ask you today, is there anyone in your life that needs to experience forgiveness? Is is there a relational stalemate, a, a conflict? Maybe it's petty, maybe it's horrific. But who is it in your life that you need to find reconciliation with? forgiveness with? Who was in your life that if you were to experience the peace of Christ reigning in your heart, that something beautiful and restorative would happen? May you think and pray upon these things today. Let's pray now. Lord, we once again thank you for the richness of Scripture. And we thank you how it, how it dramatically changes our paradigms. We thank you for how how Scripture can invite us and free us to consider something as challenging and also as something as powerful as forgiveness. And we also ask, Lord, that you would help us to allow your peace to reign in our hearts. May you help us with that, Lord, because these days are tough. Relationships are complicated. May you help us, Jesus. We thank you and we love you, Lord. Amen. A thousand times I have failed so your mercy remains And should I stumble again I'm caught in your grace everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all things
One of the ways we've all received the powerful act of forgiveness was when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And communion is a way to remember that beautiful forgiveness. Scripture tells us on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this blood, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's take a moment of silence together to just be in his presence and loving, forgiving presence together. God, we thank you so much that you forgive us, that you love us enough to forgive us all of the things, Lord God, in our lives that may feel unforgivable. We pray that as we experience the powerful forgiveness that you've shown us, that we would be willing to share and to give it to others. Thank you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you all so much for joining us today to be reminded of the loving forgiveness of God. Another last reminder to sign up for the online winter warmers at grace.org online. Go in peace. <laughs>